Gracious Father, may all who hear this gospel today receive it and know themselves to be within it. Amen. Well, in introducing this uh, second epiphany encounter to you, I know that I'm again giving the parents some homework here, you know. What is adultery? What does that mean? What's going on here? And I just want to say to the parents uh, that I believe in you. I believe in you. You can have these hard conversations with your kids and help them understand the passage on an age-appropriate level today. So have those hard conversations. You know, when you're having dinner tonight, follow up on the sermon. Um, Engage them on it. Uh, Don't just be be silent. So um, I just want to encourage you and you know, in giving you this, this homework and presenting this passage today. Well, as we walk through this passage uh, today, I, I want to invite each of us into John 8. I want to invite us into the passage. As you listen, as we talk, I want to ask us to see ourselves in the narrative. Where am I? Who am I standing with? And what does that say about me and my need? So as we go through John 8 again, and I just want to take a very simple walk through the passage and through each verse, I want to invite you to do that. Who do you naturally find yourself standing beside? We've got the Pharisees and the scribes. We've got the people being taught by Jesus. We've got Jesus himself. And we have the woman. Who are we standing with? So let's look first at verse 2. Let's talk about where this happens. Where does this encounter happen? Where does this collision with Jesus take place? Well, verse 2 makes it clear. It happens in the temple courts. Why is that significant? Jesus is here teaching the people in the temple courts. Well, of course, if you remember from our study in Exodus, the temple is a place where forgiveness is promised. It's a place where the way way home is held forth for the sinner. That's what the temple really means. So see the setup. We have Jesus himself. We have him at the Lord's temple with the leaders of his people. It's an amazing scene to consider. So it happens at the temple. What happens? Look at verses 3 to 5. What happens? An adulteress is brought to Jesus to render judgment, but clearly not for the purpose of upholding the law of God and punishing evil. I mean, it couldn't be more clear. This is not a trial. This is a mob. So there's something else at work here. And verse 6 makes it clear what's actually going on. So look now at verse 6. The scribes and the Pharisees, they bring a woman to Jesus, not to uphold the commandments, but to trap Jesus. The intent in bringing her isn't really about her. It's about Jesus. They bring her in for the very purpose of accusing Jesus himself. What a malicious, evil intent. We have to see, though, that the setup by the Pharisees and the scribes is a pretty brilliant trap if you're going to create one. They think they've got him. They think they're going to nail him finally with this one. If Jesus consents to her stoning, well, what then has become of Jesus' ability to forgive sins? What of his mission to seek and save that which was lost? Furthermore, the Jews themselves in the first century as Jesus' own crucifixion shows, could not carry out the death penalty under the Romans, leaving Jesus personally responsible for stirring up trouble if she was stoned to death. But if he lets her go, what then of his coming to fulfill the law and not abolish it? We'll come back to how Jesus meets this challenge, but that's the setup. That's what they're trying to do. They they think they've got him. They think either way he goes, they've got him. Now, second, as we consider them bringing this woman to Jesus and what's at work here, we ought to note something right away, and that's that if you actually know the commandments, if you go back to Deuteronomy 22, Deuteronomy 22 says in the law prescribing death for adultery that it says explicitly the man and the woman had to be what? Both present. They both had to be there. 
No partiality is allowed in the law of Moses. You know, here's the first lesson for the church in this passage today. We live in a time where our culture is literally uh, uh, in, inventing new ways to be sexually immoral. We, we see this, we read about it, we hear about it. What's the church's response? Well, our first response, or our first, our first thing we have to, to realize in responding is that we have to be careful. We have to be careful. As forgiven sinners, we do not respond by ignoring one form of immorality and focusing exclusively on another one. Are you with me? What do we do? We do the simplest and the hardest thing. We repent. We get on our knees before God and we repent. We repent. We get down on our knees and we say, as George Whitfield did when he saw a criminal on his way to the gallows there, but for the grace of God go I. That's the church's response. Even as, as we uphold the truth of God, we have no room for arrogance. We have no room for arrogance. So we must not act arrogantly and speak arrogantly. Next is this. What was Jesus writing? Look at verses 6 and 8. And here we come to, to what to me is one of the most fascinating incidents, incidents in the New Testament. I have always wondered, what did Jesus write? Why did he do this? I love the way the Passion of the Christ um, very briefly shows this scene. You may remember it if you saw the Passion of the Christ, but as Jesus' finger touches the dust, it literally explodes as he writes on it. And that's a hint of the meaning there. It's sort of this, uh, it's, it's a picture of the hand of God writing in the dust of the earth. Well, I got to do some digging here this week, and when you think about it, there are numerous instances in the Old Testament where God's finger writes something. You can probably think of some of those instances right now. The commandments, or the incident with Belshazzar, are two. I think the best educated guess, though, has something to do with the Old Testament passage we read from this morning, from Jeremiah 17. Listen to Jeremiah 17, 13 again. You might not have even caught it as, as Lucy read it, but listen to what it says. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth. For they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. And by the way, just a chapter earlier, Jesus called himself what? The source of living water. Eternal water. So what's happening Judgment is being reversed. It's being deflected and put back on to the people who are bringing the judgment. That's what this is all about. The religious leaders, they come to charge Jesus, but he writes his charge against them. They have forsaken the Lord through their rejection of him. And we ought to be reminded here that uh, idolatry and worship of another god is always seen in the Old Testament as what? Spiritual adultery. So they bring this woman for one form of adultery. Jesus is accusing them with a worse form of adultery. Here's the, here's the, here's the lesson. It is a dangerous thing to come into the presence of Jesus without a sufficient knowledge of your own sinfulness and need of him. Amen? how quickly the tables can turn in that kind of scenario. Augustine wrote of this incident, Jesus wrote with his finger on the ground as if indicating that the names of the people like these men were to be written in the earth, not in heaven, which is where he told his disciples they should rejoice that their names were written. Or he wrote on the ground to signify that the time had now arrived when his law should be written on soil that would bear fruit and not on sterile stones as before. Augustine is really saying here, the dust is capable of bearing more fruit than a heart of stone. Listen, friends, here is one of the other great lessons from this incident. Every time 
every time we hear the word of Jesus and we come into his presence, we receive his word, it is a revelatory moment. It's not a moment that we're going to walk away from the same. Every time we hear a sermon, we're either being hardened or nourished, but we don't leave his presence the same as before. Some people spend a lifetime in church simply adding layer of layer upon layer to a hardened heart while others find nourishment day to day, week to week, at the feet of mercy. That is something for us to consider this morning. We never leave the presence of Jesus the same. Which person are you this morning as you listen? So what's Jesus' judgment, verses 7 and 9? Let's look at verses 7 and 9. Well, his judgment is essentially this. All right, stoner. But let the first one who throws the stone be the man without sin. What an incredibly awkward pause this must have been. As Jesus again bent down to write in the dust. Perhaps this time, I mean, I'm just speculating here, but maybe even writing the names of those who accused the woman in the dust. Their very sins, confronting them now as they held stones of judgment in their hands. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. We all want justice and righteousness in the world, but none of us have it in us. And therefore, we don't want it when it comes to ourselves. You with me? All of us want justice and righteousness in the world, but none of us have it in us. And we don't want it when it comes to ourselves. Romans 3, 23 sums up the need and the condition of every person who is a son of Adam or a daughter of Eve. All have sinned and fall short of the what? The glory of God. Every one of us. Slowly, the meaning of Jesus' words and his actions are felt and understood. The jig is up. The snare didn't work. They couldn't snare him, and they can't stone her. All make their way from the sight of the would-be stoning, all except for Jesus. Here, as Augustine says, is misery met with mercy. She's alone with mercy, just mercy, holy mercy. Here is the one who can rightly and completely Undoer. Here is the man without sin. He's alone with her. Where does this leave the woman? Verses 10 and 11. He does not do it. He does not stone her. Jesus demonstrated the heart of God for sinners, not by being permissive about sin, nor by bringing the full fury of God's wrath and hatred for sin, but by offering himself up as the means of complete absolution, forgiveness, and reconciliation, he would absorb her adultery, her sin. As Rico Tice says, the stone of judgment would fall on him and hit him square on for her. And before I go on, before we close here this morning, I want to unpack those first two options for us because they're important to, to, um, to think about. First of all, he's not permissive about her sin. This is an option that we see in our culture all the time. He doesn't say to her, you know, I'm really just so glad I even got the chance to meet you. Thank you for showing up this morning. God bless you as you go. I'm sure your sin wasn't even really sin to begin with. I'm sure there were reasons. The commandment on adultery probably didn't even apply to your situation. So, you know, NBD, no big deal. Go in peace. It's all good. We need to hear this. Jesus said, go and sin no more, saints. We live in a culture that will not tolerate hearing about the shame of sin. And instead of hearing about the shame of sin, we'll make those who point it out shameful. Instead of the sin bearing shame itself. Are you with me? This kind of permissive attitude is actually an extremely dangerous way to live. To, to go forth from the presence of Jesus thinking you can go on as before is what Romans 6 is all about. Paul actually tells us in Romans 2 that it will increase our condemnation if we do. 
He says, do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to what? To lead us to what? Repentance. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Here's the amazing reversal in this passage. The woman who is brought in for judgment goes home forgiven. And the ones who brought her for judgment have heart in their hearts against Jesus himself. That's an incredible reversal. And the second option is this. He doesn't give her what she deserves. He doesn't give her the full justice of God, the fury of God's wrath upon her. He doesn't say, "Uh, now where is my stone anyways? He doesn't do that. For what does John 3.17 tell us? God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be what? Saved through him. That's Jesus' mission. Church, what Jesus did for you, he desires to do for others. For others. As Gregory the Great said, why do you think the Lord delays his coming? Is it not that he may find less to condemn when he does? That's the heart of God. That's the heart of God in Jesus Christ. Is that your heart too? Is the heart of Christ towards sinners your heart too? Those who love much have been forgiven much. We have each been forgiven much. Amen. The longer we're in the Christian life, the temptation becomes to do what? To throw stones rather than to offer bread. That's where you'll be tempted. The longer you're in the Christian life, the longer you live with the gospel as your hope, Satan will put before you the temptation to become the elder brother rather than remain the prodigal brought home by grace. To become the Pharisee rather than the publican. To become the nine ungrateful lepers rather than the one continually grateful leper. As we end, let's look at the woman's response now. Jesus asks her, as he rises, having written on the ground, has no one condemned you? And what does she say? I want to look at her words. No one, Lord. I would argue that the sum of Christian faith is found in those three words. No one, Lord. First of all, what does she do? She owns her sin. She owns her sin. She does not say, well, what do you mean? I've had a hard life. I've been used by others. I was looking for love. It wasn't my fault. The rules don't apply to me. She says none of that. She doesn't say any of that. Her words of agreement with Jesus are her confession of sin. Some of you may know that anecdote from uh, G.K. Chesterton's life. He responded to a news article that asked the question, what is wrong with the world? And he did it in his simple, direct way, saying simply, dear sirs, I am. That was essentially what the woman said to Jesus. No one, Lord. Secondly, she addresses Jesus as Lord, Kyrie. She turns to him. She stays. She stays at the feet of mercy, and you have to wonder what kept her there. Having been tossed around, having been abused by this mob, I would say she stays there because she knows somehow or another, that Jesus has the authority to pardon her, to grant her forgiveness. The story ends with, our Lord, with the Lord's powerful words. What does he say? Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Friends, that is authentic Christian faith in a nutshell. Authentic Christian faith in a nutshell. We cannot embrace Christ while coddling sin. We repent. We turn from our sin and we turn to him, placing all our trust 
in Christ alone. We do a trust transfer. So here in this epiphany moment, Jesus bypasses the temple. He's in the temple courts offering forgiveness. And he makes his pronouncement upon this case. Case dismissed. As the woman was alone with mercy, so Jesus is just as powerfully present today to redeem and forgive. What he did for the woman, he does for those who come to him by faith, who come alone to the feet of mercy and place themselves there. So the message today is come to him. Come sinners to the gospel feast. Receive it for yourselves. So we give all the glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen. After a moment of silence, let's uh, confess our faith together.